Of all the subjects that stir the imagination, this has to be one of the major ones. Financial independence. Freedom from financial concerns. Owning the financial resources that give you the means to really do what you want to do. To make your life all that you want it to be. We don't have time to go through all the interesting ideas that have been written and discussed on the subject of financial wealth, but I will offer you a few major ideas that have really made a difference in my life, financially and otherwise. Mr. Shove said to me that he thought it was a worthy goal to become financially independent for three major reasons. First, with money no longer a time-consuming consideration, I could then begin devoting heavy time to all the other dimensions of my life. Second, he suggested I become financially independent because it would tremendously increase my ability to help others. Only from positions of strength, including financial strength, can we help someone else. Finally, and most important, he said, I believe it is worthwhile to become financially independent for the sake of developing the person you must become to achieve that goal. What a major secret he taught me. Set a goal to entice you to become the person it takes to achieve it. Reaching the goal is the lesser value. The primary value lies in the person you become by reaching it. You see, it's not the million dollars that's most important. It's what you must do and become in order to be a millionaire. We're all aware that many people feel that we must be careful of focusing on money or affluence or abundance. That in it, or in the pursuit of it, there is danger. We often hear quoted from the Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I do agree. If you make money your love, and you pursue affluence to the exclusion of, or at the expense of, other values of life, you have lost, not won. However, let us consider this question. If you could do better, should you? That's not a bad question. In the time allotted to labor, in the time given to economics, care for family, success, achievement, productivity, the creation of value, the development of skills and creativity, if you could do better, should you? I think that one of the greatest satisfactions of living life to the fullest is doing the best you can with whatever you have. Doing less than your best has ways of eroding the psyche. We seem to be creatures of enterprise. Surely it is the reason for the seasons. The soil and the sun and the rain and the seed all say, what can you do with us? The seasons say, do you have the genius to make something unique of us? Life says, here's the raw material. What splendid things can you produce from all there is? So, go for high productivity, the full employment of your genius, the full development of your potential in all areas of your life, including earning money. That is the essence of life. Truly sophisticated people know it isn't the amount that counts. It's doing all that you can with all you've got that counts. With that background, let me recommend a book for you to read. The title is the Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Perhaps you've already read it. I would suggest that you read it again. It's just a small book. You can read it in one evening. I call it the appetizer for the full discourse on the subject of financial independence. Now, let me give you the major theme of the book. The major theme is that what you do with what you have is more important than what you have. What you do with what you get is more important than what you get. What we do with what we have says so much about us. It reveals our philosophy of life, our attitude, what we know and what we think, and the makeup of our character. It is a reflection of what is going on inside of our head and within our value system and decision-making process. It also reveals our ability to weigh and to perceive the outer is always a reflection of the inner. It is an indication, a reading, a revealing. It speaks, it tells, it shows. Remember that key phrase I gave you earlier? Everything is symptomatic of something, and it is symptomatic of something right or something wrong. 
It is a wise policy not to ignore the symptoms, for they can be early signs of a poor choice of philosophy or a sign that something important is being misread, misunderstood, miscalculated. So of all places, take a look here. What you are doing with your money says something about you. Now, what you're doing may be okay. All I'm suggesting is that you take a look. Let me give you some of the details of a good financial plan as suggested by Clayson's book. First, a very broad but important statement. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Net meaning the money you have left after paying your taxes. And before we go any further, let us consider that most important part of our personal, social, and economic life. We must all in our lifetime, whether we are young or old, understand the necessity and the practice of paying taxes. We have to teach our children as soon as they have any money at all from any source that if they spend it for anything, they immediately become what we call a consumer. And all consumers of goods and services, no matter how young, have to pay taxes. In California, where I live, if a child is only 10 years old and goes to the store to buy something that costs a dollar, the proprietor asks him for an extra six cents. The child may look at the price tag and say to the proprietor, but it says a dollar. What's the six cents for? And what a great time to teach the necessity for everybody to pay taxes, even at age 10. So a full explanation is due. If you're going to take six cents off a kid, you've got to tell him where it goes. After all, it is his six cents. He could well ask the proprietor, do you keep it? The proprietor, of course, would explain that it's for taxes, that he doesn't get to keep it, that he merely collects it. The next obvious questions are, who gets it? And what is it used for? And with these very intelligent questions come some very important answers. To the child, we explain, since we all have decided to live together, we call ourselves a society. And for that society to function, there are some things we cannot individually do for ourselves. We cannot each build a piece of the street. The machinery would be too expensive, and it would take too long to learn how to use it and then to do it. So we have a government, and government is people we have put to work doing those things for us as a community that we cannot do for ourselves. The streets, the sidewalks, the police, all of this must be paid for. So we have agreed to take some of the money when all of us buy something and give it to the government so that it can do things for us. This is such an important subject. Kids have to learn it. We all have to learn it. We then move up to federal taxes and all that those tax dollars are meant to do. Here's a pretty good way to explain federal taxes. I call paying taxes the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. It is so very important to feed the goose, not abuse the goose, not tear off a wing of the goose, but to feed and care for it. You might say, well, yes, but the goose eats too much. Hey, that's probably true. But remember, just about every appetite eats too much. Don't we all eat too much? Let not one appetite accuse another. If you step on the scales and you're 10 pounds heavy, you've got to say, yes, me and the government are about 10 pounds heavy. Looks like we both eat too much. Remember, every appetite must be disciplined, yours, mine, and the government's. We could all use a diet. Mr. Schoff did give me a very great service when he taught me how to be a happy taxpayer. Now, I must admit it took a while, but I did finally become a happy taxpayer. Part of it was understanding what tax dollars were for and that it is right for everyone to pay his fair share. I finally decided I didn't mind picking up my share of the tab for the radar. It's so necessary for our safety as a country to keep the international bullies away. Some people say, why bother with all that expensive equipment? After all, they won't come over here. Obviously, they haven't read their history books. Someone else says, I'm not picking up any part of the radar. Well, then I would suggest you go where they don't have any radar. If you are going to enjoy the benefits, then you have to pay your share. 
Jesus, the master teacher, gave some very clear advice one day when he said, pay Caesar first. Caesar meaning the government and taxes. Hey, that's pretty clear. Pay Caesar first. And for some unique reason, he didn't see fit to criticize Caesar. He just said, pay. I don't think we need a prophet to explain that one to us. Now, don't pay more than you should. Take advantage of the advantages and the incentives. But then when you get to the bottom line, whatever that is, pay it. And pay with happiness, knowing that you are feeding the goose that lays the golden eggs. The golden eggs of freedom, safety, protection, justice, free enterprise. A society that works, provides a market, an unprecedented opportunity. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, education for our children. This is the most powerful nation on earth, and it provides us with the greatest chance to create a unique life. Some goose, some eggs. And remember, everyone should pay. Dignity demands that we all contribute no matter how small the amount. Everyone should pay. Even the federal tax bill, in my opinion. If only a dollar a year, that's okay. Just so you can say with dignity, I pay my fair share. A classic example. An ancient Bible story says Jesus and his disciples were watching people come by and contribute to the treasury. Some came by and gave large amounts. Some gave average amounts. And some gave modest amounts. The story then continues. A little lady came along and put two pennies in the treasury. Jesus said to his disciples, look at that, the lady and the two pennies. They said, two pennies? You give us this example out of all who made a contribution? Two pennies? He said, you don't understand. She gave more than anyone else. They said, two pennies? More than anyone else? Some have given fortunes. He said, you don't understand. Her two pennies represented, I'm sure, more of what she had than the large amounts represented of what their givers had. So she gave the most. How remarkable. But let's continue the story. Sometimes what is not said or reported is also a valuable part of the story. Consider what Jesus did not do. He did not take the two pennies out of the treasury and run after the little lady and say, Here, little lady, we have observed that you are so poor and so pitiful, we're going to give you back your two pennies. We just can't let you pay. What an incredible insult that would have been. She would surely have said, aren't my two pennies good enough? They represent a great portion of what I have. Will you take away my dignity? No, that scene did not occur. And what a meaningful lesson. We learn from what did not happen as well. Let me give you the eloquence of silence. The eloquence of what was not reported, but certainly must have been true. And it reads, Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury. What an important silent statement. It's of the highest philosophy. It best explains our earthly experience. Life is conditional. Value is on the other side of price. And of first importance is the act, not the amount. Everyone must pay, even if it is only two pennies. Now, after taxes, and I said all that to get to this, learn to live on 70%. The reason it's 70 is because you're going to be doing some very special things with the 30%. So what's left, 70%, is yours to spend. Now let's talk about the all-important subject of how you allocate the 30%. I remember one day saying to Mr. Schoff, if I had more money, I would have a better plan. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, I would suggest that if you had a better plan, you would have more money. So it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts. It's not what you allocate, it's how you allocate it. Here's the first part of the allocation process. Of the 30% you're not spending, 10% should go to charity, 
giving back part of what you have taken out to help those who cannot help themselves. I think that's a good percentage. Now, you can pick your own percentage. It's your life, and it's your plan. But giving your money to a church or to an institution is a good idea. More often than not, they can find the people who are in need. But whether you administer it yourself or give it to an institution to distribute, 10% should be given to charity. And by the way, the best time to teach this allocation process is when a child gets his first dollar. Take him on a visual tour. There's nothing better than visual to illustrate what you're trying to teach. Take him to where some very unfortunate people live who cannot take care of themselves. Kids have big hearts. If they see the problem, they won't have any trouble giving a dime out of every dollar. And one more thing. The time to start this is when the amounts are small. It's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar. And it's a little more difficult to give away a hundred thousand out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not so sure. That's a lot of money. Best we start you early. So you will have the habit before the big money comes your way. Now, here is what to do with the next 10%. Set aside 10% for capital you manage. That is, capital you find ways to utilize. Do some buying and selling yourself. Buy something, fix it, and sell it. Engage in commerce, even if it's only a part-time venture. Your home is a major capital project. In my opinion, we should all engage in capitalism in this country. Here, we believe capital belongs in the hands of the people. Communism teaches that capital belongs in the hands of the state. That's a great difference in ideology. I guess communism feels that humans are too dumb and stupid to know what to do with capital. So it should all be given to the state. Let the state run everything. And let the people meekly show up for their work assignments. In our country, we believe the genius to know what to do with capital resides in the populace. The people, the genius to come up with ideas for goods and services brought to the marketplace. It has built a dynamic enterprise known as capitalism and has created opportunities in abundance. And again, remember this thought. The best time to teach capitalism is when a child is old enough to be stimulated by ideas for goods and services. Kids learn the concept of performing services in exchange for capital early, right? They mow the lawn, help in the house, earn an allowance. But take it a step beyond that as soon as possible. They will pick it up fast. Kids ought to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. It doesn't take much to be in business. It doesn't take a million dollars. And the same business principles apply whether it is a bicycle business or General Motors. Show kids how to buy a bottle of soap for $2 and sell it for 3 Right in the neighborhood. It's called capitalism in action. Profits, products, and services brought to the marketplace. It is most exciting once you understand the mechanics and the dynamics. It's the stuff of which fortunes are made. And teach kids the advantage of being kids. Some people will buy from you just because you're little. So you must get on with it. You won't be little forever. So Johnny goes a few doors down from your home in the neighborhood and knocks on a door. Mrs. Jones answers, and Johnny says, Mrs. Jones, I have this bottle of soap. It is the best there is. My mother uses it, and lots of people I know wouldn't use anything else. You should really have some. It only costs $3, and I'm your neighbor, so I can take care of you. And besides, I'm little. There, isn't that simple? Commerce in action capitalism at its foundation. You see, the only danger in capitalism is if capital gets in the hands of too few people. As long as it is in the hands of the many, it is a dynamic force for profitable and exciting enterprise. Back to our story. Mrs. Jones says, Johnny, I appreciate your coming by, and I think your product is unique, but really, to be honest with you, I have plenty of soap. Johnny says, let me come in and check. Hey, kids know how to overcome objections. They have been mastering that skill all their lives. Johnny knows how to get in the door. Mrs. Jones says, you've got me. I'll be a customer. 
Now, when he comes home, you must get ready to teach all the other principles of enterprise and successful living. The two should go together. First, Johnny says, I've got three dollars to spend. And you point out the obvious. If you spend all three dollars, you will be out of business. He says, I can see that. Then you explain, you must set aside two dollars to invest in another bottle of soap. You can't spend your capital. Capital must be carefully preserved. What would you think of a farmer who ate his seed corn? Dumb farmer, right? So capital must be defended. It is your only chance for another harvest. Now here is another thought for your notes. Make sure you turn part of your income into capital. I would suggest 10%. And use that 10% yourself to give your own skill a chance to do something remarkable in the marketplace. No telling what genius lies, unused, waiting for the spark of opportunity. It is part of the path of fortune. Use this thought. Why not work full-time on your job and part-time on your fortune? You can, you know. It's up to you. And you can't believe the feelings every day when you can honestly say, I'm working to become wealthy. I'm not just working to pay my bills. It makes a different kind of day. You will find it hard to go to bed at night and exciting to get out of bed in the morning. Remember, it's the same day, the same opportunity, the same you. But it is a greatly different life working to become wealthy or working to get by. Now, here is the next principle to teach. Johnny says, okay, I'll set aside $2 so I can stay in business and continue to make $1 profit. But I get to spend the $1, right? Now comes a most important opportunity. You must explain that if he spends that whole dollar, he will wind up broke and unhappy. And then take him on another visual tour to some part of town where he can get a good look at people who spend all they make and are broke and unhappy and say, do you want to live like this? He will say, no. Then you say, all right then, you can't spend the whole dollar. He says, well then, tell me what to do with it. And with that open door comes the obvious opportunity to teach all the principles of wealth and happiness and lifestyle. One of the major factors that affects your life all your life is what you do with your money. So here is what you do. First, pay your taxes, right? And for kids, that is easy. They pay when they spend, unless they make a lot of money. Then you must teach them to pay federal taxes. Remember the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. Next comes the 10 cents for charity, which we have already covered. Johnny says, oh yes, here is a dime for those who cannot help themselves. Now I can spend the rest. Answer, no, no. You will wind up broke and unhappy. He says, okay, what now? And now comes another major life lesson. The next 10 cents out of every dollar of wages or profit is for the increase of capital you manage. Set aside 10 cents out of every dollar profit so that someday you can buy two bottles of soap instead of one. I'm sure Johnny will catch on to that one right away. He says, of course. If you buy two bottles instead of one, you save yourself a trip. How clever. And the next point you teach is that some companies will sell you two bottles cheaper than if you buy just one bottle at a time. They sell you one bottle for $2 and two bottles for $3.80. Johnny says, wow, then when I sell it, I can make even more money. How clever. It's true, everybody benefits from the increase of capital. The company gets to sell two bottles at one time. You save a trip and some costs, and you can keep some of the saving or pass along some of it to Mrs. Jones, your customer. Let's review so far. First, pay taxes. Next, 10 cents for charity and 10 cents for capital you manage and for the increase of that capital out of every dollar of wages or profits. Now, here's the third 10 cents from every dollar, and that is capital you provide. Take 10 cents out of every dollar and put it in a financial institution. 
And now we have come to a major benefit for all of us if you bring this 10% of your earnings to the marketplace. You see, some projects in our society need more capital than one person can provide. So we have a system whereby all of us can loan or invest our money in capital provided so that large businesses can be built to provide more jobs and products and service and help create an even more dynamic society. So 10 cents out of every dollar should go into a savings account. I really prefer to call it an investment account because, and kids will love this, they pay you for the use of your money. You can get back the money you loaned and you will have more profit from what you are paid for the use of your money. And be sure that you teach this, that if kids start this program from whatever they earn on a job or in engaging in enterprise or both while they are in their teens, by the time they are 40, they will be wealthy enough to be able to do what they want to do the rest of their lives instead of all their lives doing what they have to do. Now, from your teenage years, it could take a much shorter period of time to become financially independent, depending on what ideas and opportunities you take advantage of. Mrs. Fields developed a new chocolate chip cookie and became a millionaire before she was 30. Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies. What an example of capital in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the state. A 10-year-old takes a dollar searches around the community and finds a broken, abandoned wagon, pays a dollar for it, brings it home, cleans it up, sands off the rust, paints it till it's shiny and new, straightens out the wheel, and sells the like-new wagon for $11. You ask, does a 10-year-old deserve $10 profit? And the answer is, of course. Society now has a mended wagon. And that's what it's all about. Find something and leave it better than you found it. Create a value. Build an equity. It's how we build this most dynamic society called America. And everyone can contribute. Everyone can bring some value to the marketplace. We can all be students of capital, profit, equity, and value. We can all engage in enterprise. We can all participate in the disciplines that bring wealth of lifestyle and treasure. All of us and our children can build the most powerful and attractive society ever. We have the knowledge, the tools, the schools, the market, the resources. All we need is the will. Let each of us begin. Its riches are for the having. All of these principles in action furnish, to the best of my knowledge, the best soil from which to have a high chance for fortune and lifestyle at a very early age. It is so simple, but it is so powerful. Just try it. Just try it. You can always go back to the old way. But if you just try it, I predict you will be so excited about your new commitment and discipline for wealth that you will never turn back. What we're seeing here is that wealth is a matter of allocation, not opportunity, especially in this country. There are subtleties on both sides of any issue of health and sickness, the issues of success and failure, it is the subtleties that determine the direction and the destination. The major reason it is so subtle is because what you do in a single day or a single week or month doesn't seem to matter that much. But remember, as we said earlier, everything matters. Everything weighs something. Sophisticated people never say it doesn't matter. If you spend or invest $5 today, it doesn't seem to matter much either way. You seem to be no richer or poorer at the end of the day. But it does make all the difference in the world as you save $5 every day and the days accumulate into weeks and into months and into years. You see, it's the accumulated total of the allocation of each day that makes all the difference in the world whether you become rich or poor, healthy or ill, successful or mediocre. Now back to Johnny. He is going to ask about his investment account where he's putting 10 cents out of every dollar. What kind of interest do they pay kids? So you give him the blockbuster, same as adults. That will be almost unbelievable. At last he can be treated like an adult. 
getting that adult interest when you're only a kid. And one added note, just by working this part of the financial independence plan alone, by putting aside less than $200 a month, will make you a millionaire in 30 years. Remember, it's called the subtlety of wealth or poverty. What you do in one day doesn't seem to matter. But as all sophisticated kids and adults know, it is the accumulated days of proper allocation of your money that makes you wealthy. It is using the ideas we're discussing, coupled with the passing of a little time, that creates fortunes. Now, the passing of time is automatic, but using the ideas is a matter of your own discipline. Whether you want to or not, or whether you care or not, Bottom line, it's all up to you. Let me give you the definition of rich and poor. It is brief, but I'm sure you will get the message. Here it is. Poor people spend their money and save what's left. And you guessed it already. Rich people save their money and spend what's left. Remember, it's the same money, just a different philosophy. If 20 years ago, two people each earned $1,000 a month, and they each had an average increase in income over the last 20 years. One had the philosophy, spend your money, save what's left. And the other had the philosophy, save your money and spend what's left. Today, 20 years later, we call one poor and the other rich. The difference was in philosophy. But I can't stress too much the subtlety of it all. At the end of a day or a week or a month, it doesn't seem to matter. A rich plan or a poor plan to an unsophisticated person. But to make wise decisions, we must all weigh a larger measure of the result. We don't just weigh a week. We weigh five years of weeks, ten years of weeks, and let the weight of that measure determine the change in our weekly activity and commitment. Wise decisions for wealth and lifestyle come from the wise measure of results. Hey, here is a great philosophy to learn and to teach, especially to your kids. They will love it. It is called the ant philosophy. You know, little ants. There's a Bible phrase that says, everyone, especially lazy people, should study ants. Ants are unique. Consider this. First, an ant will never quit. If he is headed somewhere and you put your hand in his way, he will try to climb over, climb under, climb around, he keeps trying. If you let him go on his way, away he goes. And if you put something in his way again, he will try again to go over, under, around. And guess how long an ant will try? Answer, until he dies. So, an ant will never quit. What a philosophy. Next part of the ant philosophy. Guess what an ant has in the back of his mind all summer? Answer, winter. Ants prepare for winter all summer. How very bright. Now, some adults aren't that smart. They think summer all summer. That philosophy we call fatal. Now, here's another piece of ant philosophy. Question, how much will an ant gather in the summer to prepare for the winter? Answer, all he possibly can. That's it. The secret to the higher life, doing all you possibly can. That is the great life quest, seeing what all you can become. A man says to me, Mr. Rohn, I'm making about $50,000 a year. Isn't that enough? I'm taking care of my family, and we are comfortable. Isn't 50000 enough? And my answer is, yes, it is enough, if it's the best you can do in the time allotted to labor and enterprise. However, if you are capable of making a half million dollars a year and you only make 50000 we call you loser. Remember, it's not the amount that counts. It's the extent of your reach that counts. If your best is 10000 a year, that's enough. If your best is a million dollars a year, that's enough. It's not the amount. It's your best we count. How tall will a tree grow? Answer, as tall as it can. Did you ever hear of a tree growing half as high as it could? No. 
Only humans with the power of choice settle for less than they can be. But I would ask you to walk the high road. Earn as much money as you can. Share as much as you can. Create all you can. Read as many books as you can. See as many places as you can. Become as skillful as you can. It's your birthright. Now, part of the learning to live on 70% falls under another fundamental, which we will cover in another session in this cassette program, that talks about lifestyle. How to get joy from your 70%. And that's what life is all about, doing the things that bring us satisfaction and joy. But before we move on to this subject, let me add a few closing notes on the subject of a good financial plan. I've come up with the major role of grandparents in this country. Here it is. The major role of grandparents in this country should be to teach their grandchildren how to be wealthy, cultured, and happy, just like me. Grandparents should not have to say, I've worked all my life, now I need help. They should be able to say, I've worked all my life, now I can help. If you are not financially independent by age 40 to 50, it doesn't mean you live in the wrong country. It doesn't mean you live in the wrong community. It doesn't mean you live at a wrong time. It doesn't mean you are a wrong person. It doesn't mean you have the wrong chance. It simply means you have the wrong plan. I discovered you can be a nice person with the wrong plan. You can be a sincere person with a poor plan. And remember, it's not uncommon. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. When they make a moonshot, it isn't the first set of the guidance systems that serves for the whole trip. They have what is known as mid-course corrections, those fine-tuned changes that set you on a more certain course. And on the way to the destination called the moon, they are so important. Hey, if there's one objective you don't want to miss, it's the moon. Now, if you will make wealth and financial freedom that important a necessity, you will have the highest chance to arrive. Next, if you have not done so in a while, or if you have never done so, put together a financial statement. When I first met Mr. Shelf and we talked about financial independence, he asked me if I had a current financial statement. I said, what is a financial statement? So I got my primary education in taking a picture of where I was financially. Mr. Shelf explained that it is very important to know exactly where you are without kidding yourself so that you can then come up with a good plan for going from where you are to where you want to be. It turned out to be fairly easy to put one together. You merely list the value of your assets on one side of a piece of paper and the total of what you owe, called your liabilities, on the other side of the paper. Then by subtracting one from the other, you come up with what we call your current net worth. Now, it doesn't tell you what you are worth as a person but rather what you are worth in money. I said to Mr. Shelf, my financial statement isn't going to look that good. He said, it is not important how good it looks. What is important is that you do it. So I put that first financial statement together. I had plenty of liabilities, money I owed my parents, budget finance, my car, and all kinds of other debts. Now on the asset side, I really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. I even put my shoes on the asset side. They were worth something. Wow, how embarrassing after six years of working. But it must be done. You don't have to put the results on a public bulletin board because it's not important that the community knows how you are doing. It's not important that I know how you're doing, but it's desperately important that you know how you're doing. Here are some other points. First, keep excellent books, not only for tax purposes, but for yourself, your financial future, and for your own sense of self-worth. Have you ever heard the expression, I don't know where it all goes? Well, from now on, make a new commitment to financial independence and to the value and the feeling that comes from knowing where it all goes and where it all comes from. 
It is just one of those important disciplines that cause you to prove to yourself that you are on a new road, walking in a new direction, becoming a new person, and arriving at a new destination. Without that effort, you will keep falling back. Hey, I found out you can make $5,000 a month and still go broke. You say, how could you go broke making $5,000 a month? It's easy. Spend $6,000. And when you make $5,000, spending $6,000 is not that difficult. Someone once said, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. So, be the master over whatever you have and whatever you are. That's where the seeds of greatness are sown. Great wealth, great health, great results, great influence, and great lifestyle. Take interest and even delight in doing all the small things well. It makes you a sophisticated person who knows where the beginnings of wealth and happiness are. There's a Bible phrase that we could quote here that would be appropriate. It says, If you will be faithful over a few things, the small things, you will someday be ruler over many things and major things. That's it. That's the philosophy that counts. Surely life is reluctant to hand a fortune to someone who constantly messes up his paycheck. It's not the amount that counts. It's the plan and the faithful discipline of that plan that counts. The disciplines are those ingenious keys that unlock the door to the kind of person we really want to become. And becoming attracts all those treasures and values that most anyone would call the good life. Life in abundance, life in productivity, life in enterprise, life in influence, life in style. Now, to wind up this rather lengthy subject, let me close with this. Mr. Shelf's best instructions to me in those early years were to develop a new attitude, a new attitude about myself and a new attitude about all the principles that it takes to make life unique. Develop a new attitude about taxes, about paying your bills, about the marketplace, opportunity, your chances, wealth, activity, prosperity, service, productivity. Let me give you a good example of my old attitude. I used to say, I hate to pay my taxes. Shelf said, well, you can live that way if you want to. That's one attitude. I was a bit perplexed. I thought it was the only attitude. How strange. I used to say, I hate to pay my bills. And he said, well, you can live that way if you want to. I thought it was the only way. I used to say, I hate to part with my money. He said, that's one choice for lifestyle and attitude. I thought, could it be that there is another way to feel about it? He said, what if you said, I love to pay my taxes, knowing it's the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs? What if you said, I love to pay my bills, reduce my liabilities, and increase my assets? What if you said, I love to part with my money, put it into circulation, help build this dynamic society? Wouldn't that be a better way to live if you loved to instead of hated to? What an incredible way to look at it. I bought the idea and started the practice. I will admit that it took me a while to actually say truthfully, I love to. But when I did, I found a completely unique new way to live, to love to instead of hate to. Shof even taught me to pay my bills with enthusiasm. He said, the next time you pay $100 on an account, put a note inside with your check that says, with great excitement, I send you this hundred dollars. He said, you won't believe what happens on the other end. They don't get many notes like that. But best of all, you won't believe what happens on your end. The new feeling of being in control and having a philosophy of life that brings joy instead of frustration. This whole new attitude will create for you a whole new world. Remember, it's something anyone can do. Mr. Shove got me to open my first savings account. He said, do you have a savings account? I said, I don't have enough money. And he reminded me, it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan. The important thing is to begin. 
Wealth is a plan, not an amount. He asked me if I had $10. I said, well, yes. He said, then open up your savings account and do it with your new attitude and enthusiasm. Well, that took some doing. I went to the bank in the town where I lived and walked in to open my account. I went to the window and told the lady I wanted to open up a savings account. She said, great. What is your name? I said, Mr. Roan. She said, fine, Mr. Roan, just fill out these papers. I filled them out, handed them back to her, and she said, that's all in order. Now, how are we going to get this account started? I said, put 10 in. She said, 10 what? I said, $10. Now, can you imagine the scene? I'm a grown man, 25 years old. I have a family. I'm working and opening up my first savings account with $10. I said, hey, this may not seem like much, but I have a great plan. In fact, before long, I'll probably have the largest savings account in this bank. She said, well, if you say so. It was a bit embarrassing, I must admit, but Shof said, get excited about where you're going and excited about the fact that you are one of the few who have a wealth plan in place and working. To make a long story short, guess what? Within less than three years, I did have the largest savings account in that bank. Now, it was just a small country bank, but I did reach my goal. What magic! And how quickly it works once you develop a new plan and a new attitude and commit to the discipline to do it. Wealth plans, anyone can have them. Wealth goals, anyone can design them. Wealth habits and disciplines, anyone can develop them. Why not start today? This can be a new day that opens up a new future and creates a new excitement about life and its possibilities for you.